Okay, so there's a lot to say, but I'm going to start with 1 Timothy. Paul writes to Timothy, I also want the women to dress modestly, with decency and propriety, adorning themselves, not with elaborate hairstyles or gold or pearls or expensive clothes, but with good deeds, appropriate for women who profess to worship God. He could have said the same to men. Don't worry about what you're wearing. Adorn yourself with good deeds. Do good works. That should be what you are clothed in, so to speak. But then Paul says this stuff that is sexist. A woman should learn in quietness and full submission. I do not permit a woman to teach or to assume authority over a man. She must be quiet. Now notice he's saying, I do not permit. He's giving advice sort of bishop to bishop to Timothy, who is a the next generation of the apostles, meaning Timothy's a bishop, he's telling him what he himself does and his reasons for it. He's not necessarily saying, this is what God says we should do. He is pre presenting this as his personal way, and he's giving his reasons for it. Why does he not want women to teach? For Adam was formed first, then Eve, and Adam was not the one deceived. It was the woman who was deceived and became a sinner. But women will be saved through childbearing if they continue in faith, love, and holiness with propriety. Now, in the first century, this is how people thought of women. There's a difference between the um, central message of what the Bible teaches or the church teaches and its cultural, you might say, its cultural accretions or the fact that there is a truth coming from God that is filtered through certain individuals who are writing these passages and who are living at a particular time. Now, we as moderns know that women can be very good teachers and that women need not only look to fulfill their lives through childbirth. And yet, Paul is making a point, if you think about it, that is profound. If you can pierce through any shock you might have at this apparently sexist language, you can see that what he's saying is women can bear children. Obviously, men cannot. He seems to be saying that in that act of self-giving, and at the time it was a dangerous thing to give birth to a child, it still can be in, certainly, in certain places today. We have low infant mortality among developed nations this day and age, but there is still a chance that a woman might die in childbirth, more so in undeveloped countries. And back then, there was an even higher chance of that. So that in bringing babies into the world, women were putting their lives at risk. At risk. And of course, as you know, if you have brothers or sisters, babies are a lot of work. So there's a lot of self-giving that is sort of built into the nature of women that men don't participate in that same sort of thing. Of course, men have to also make self-sacrifices to raise a family, but Paul is talking about the nature of women. He's mixing it in with other personal attitudes toward what he thinks a women, women can and cannot do. But the point I'm making is you've got to see some of these things both through the lens of the time that they were written and, more importantly, for what these writings communicate that are timeless and not merely bound by time. And that we see in the book of Joshua. Now, I wanted to start with Paul as a kind of springboard, because if this doesn't shock you, then you're not reading the Bible appropriately. Then Joshua and all the Israelites took Achan, the silver, the robe, the bar of gold, his sons, daughters, cattle, donkeys, sheep, goats, tent, and everything he had, and they brought them to the valley of Achor. Now Achan has stolen these things. Remember, they were particularly told the Jews were not invading Jericho and plundering Jericho for their own benefit. They were to give whatever they took from Jericho to the treasury of the priests. It was supposed to go to the Lord because the idea wasn't we are taking over militarily the promised land for our own benefit. The Lord wants us to wipe away the pagans who are practicing child sacrifice, but we are not personally 
to do this for the sake of greed. And yet that's what Achan does. So what do they do? They take all of his stuff and his family. Then Joshua said to Achan, why have you brought trouble on us? The Lord will now bring trouble on you. And all the Israelites stoned Achan and his family and burned their bodies. Not just Achan, his family too. They piled a great heap of stones over Achan, which remains to this day. That is why the place has been called the Valley of Trouble ever since. Well, that's appropriate. So the Lord was no longer angry. Well, you got trouble, my friends. You got trouble right here in the Promised Land. Now, that's shocking. That's disturbing. They kill the guy and his family. And yet, let's take a look at some of our other readings. David, or the psalmist, writes in Psalm 7, O Lord my God, if I have done this, if there is wrong in my hands, if I have repaid my friend with evil or plundered my enemy without cause, let the enemy pursue my soul and overtake it and let him trample my life to the ground and lay my glory in the dust. In other words, if I've done what Achan did, if I've plundered my enemy without cause, as Achan did when he stole from Jericho, let me be punished. The psalmist continues, Behold, the wicked man conceives evil and is pregnant with mischief and gives birth to lies. When we give ourselves over to evil, we have to live by the lie. And what did Achan do? He didn't. He wasn't honest about it until at the very end, they went from the tribe of Judah to the family of Zimri to so forth and so on, and then they find him, and then he confesses. But of course, you give yourself over to the lie when you give yourself over to wickedness. The wicked man makes a pit, digging it out, and falls into the hole that he has made. His mischief returns upon his own head, and on his own skull, his violence descends. Now, we're so used to hearing about a God who forgives, and we're so used to going to confession, and we're so used to having our sins wiped out. We're used to a kind of cheap grace. This is how life works, not just human beings. It's not just that men punish other men or women punish other women or what have you. Built into the nature of reality is you suffer when you've done wrong and you make others suffer for it. All of Israel suffered because of Achan's greed. Let's look at what Isaiah says. Tell the righteous it will be well with them for they will enjoy the fruit of their deeds, the righteous will, but woe to the wicked, disaster is upon them. They will be paid back for what their hands have done, as Achan was. Youths oppress my people. Women rule over them. Things are so bad in Israel that there's no strong leader. My people, your guides lead you astray. They turn you from the path. One of the really bad things that can happen to any nation is to be guided by bad leaders. The Lord takes his place in court. He rises to judge the people. We still have a leader in God, but what's he going to do? The Lord enters into judgment against the elders and leaders of his people, saying, quoting the Lord, it is you who have ruined my vineyard. The plunder from the poor is in your houses. What do you mean by crushing my people and grinding the faces of the poor, declares the Lord? the Lord Almighty. The plunder from the poor is in your houses. Now that also is an echo of what we read in Joshua. Joshua plunders the city of Jericho. Not Joshua, I'm sorry. Um, Achan, Achar, whatever his name is. The bad guy takes what he shouldn't take and keeps it for himself. And then later in the time of Isaiah, the Lord says to the Israelites, you have plundered the poor, and, and the evidence of that is in your houses. In the same way that Achar had the bar of gold, the this, the that, he had all the booty, all the plunder with him and was hiding it, God is now saying to the Israelites, you have plundered the poor, and their stuff is in your houses, and I will have nothing to do with you. I will destroy you because of that. This is how we get retribution. It's built into the nature of reality. We're used to mercy and goodness, which is also part of God. But what you see, especially in the Old, in the Old Testament, is something harsher. 
and something more realistic in some ways. Now, I'm going to finish up. The church says there's a preferential option for the poor. The plunder from the poor is in your houses. We have that in our society. We have allowed the rich to get richer and the poor to get poorer. We have allowed the poor to be decimated. We have allowed the poor to live lives that are on the verge of despair. And there, the stuff that should belong to them, in a sense, are in our houses. Woe be to us if the full wrath of God comes upon us. Now that, you see, is how this all fits together. When you're reading the Bible, look past the historical setting and the context. It's important, but more than that is, what's it really saying? Don't be shocked at the mere violence. Don't be shocked at the sexism, which was natural for them back then. But look at what's underneath it and look at the lessons that are really being taught.